Hi, and welcome to the Whiskey Amateur Class session number three. Today, we are going to do a quick recap of session one and two to see what we covered so far. Then I'm going to talk in great detail about how whiskey is made. Then I'm going to show you some mistakes that beginners do and how to fix it. I will give you recommendations and show you how much you should pay for a good bottle of whiskey. Last but not least, I am going to summarize the main takeaways from the first three sessions. So ideally, after session number one and two, you know what whiskey is, so that what is the meaning of whiskey, the origins, definition, and so on. You learn the very important principle that quality over quantity. You can also answer the question, why do Scottish and Irish distillers use used casks? You know the difference between a blend, a single malt, or a bourbon whiskey. You heard the four biggest misconceptions. You got to know also some distilleries, the six different regions in Scotland, and their main styles. You also know why do Scottish distillers use malted barley in the first place. And you have an idea about cast sizes, oak types, and also about the importance of maturation. Well done. And now today, the first topic is how is whiskey made? So whiskey production, production is very, very complex. So on one hand, it's a strict science, so to say. But on the other hand, you will see shortly that it's also art. So right now, you know a lot about whiskey, but I really want to show you in greater detail how you should imagine the whole process. That starts actually with the grain preparation. What does that mean? And here, let me please use my cheat sheet. So for barley-based whiskey, you have to first malt the barley. So what does that mean? This means that you have to steep into cold water the barley. Why? This is the so-called germination process. The barley is germinated for up to a week on a malting floor. Imagine that you put the barley into cold water and what does it happen? The barley starts to grow, so the seed opens up. Why is this essential? Because you want to access the inside of the barley that you can convert into sugars, because from sugars you can distill the alcohol. So first you want to open the seed, and this is why you steep it into water and leave it to germinate on the malting floor. But the second step is that you have to dry it. Why? Because you actually don't want the barley to grow. You want to stop this process. You want to halt this process. So barley germination is halted, for example, by kilning it. And here you see a kiln with peat. With, when, when you burn the peat, it automatically uh, generates heat and smoke that will eventually dry and halt the germination process. So now that the seeds are open, you want to stop the germination process. So the, once it dried, uh, the barley are ground into grist to make the starches accessible. So now you want to access the inside of the, of the seed. And this is called the mashing. And in the mashing, you basically want to extract sugars. And because once you access it, the starch can be fermented into sugars. And this is the mashing process. You can see it here in these two pictures. And once this takes place, this warm and sweet liquid is called the wort. Then comes the fermentation process that takes place in a wash bag. So you transfer the wort into the wash bags where you add yeast and yeast is normally a is, is, is added in a liquid form and it will convert this warm wort into alcohol and this will be roughly seven to nine uh, percent abv which is more or less like a beer and 
this is when the actual distillation starts and there first the first distillation is called uh, is 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 taking place in um in a, a wash still and after the first distillation the alcohol will be roughly 25 percent abv and after that from the wash still it is transferred to the spirit still where the second distillation takes place and then the, you will get an alcohol roughly around 70 percent abv and here you see how two pot stills so this is how you should imagine it and observe that on the left hand side you see the pot stills of the Lagavulin distillery. On the right hand side you see the Brookladdy pot still that they use. And observe the differences. So these are two very different shape, shaped and formed stills. So one has a very narrow neck and a very long neck. On the other hand, the Lagavulin stills are more like a pair. So this will impact and influence flavors a lot. So keep this in mind. And last but not least, the maturation takes place. So once the spirit is distilled, you will put into wood casks to mature. And here I just gave you the source that I used. If you have time, feel free to read this 400 pages long book or just follow my channel. And also check out on my YouTube channel, I created a playlist with the Home and Distillery where you can see very nice videos from all of these steps so that you have a better idea how does this take place in reality. This is a nice warehouse, but I think everybody could imagine that. And this is a chart or a, or a graph that I really liked that the Kihome and Distillery created. So here you can see starting from really the harvest, barley fields and the combine. So here the, the barley is basically put into cold water, it's steeped. Afterwards, the malting floor, the germination process takes place for roughly a week. Afterwards, you want to stop the germination process. So you put fire in the kiln and it will be dry. Then it's milled, and after it's milled, you will put it into the mash tun, where it will take the mashing will take place. Here you will have roughly a beer. It's not really a beer, but it's 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 very very close to the beer, so it will be uh, an alcohol. It it will have an alcohol volume of seven to nine percent ABV. Then it is transferred to the wash bag, where they add yeast, and it will be fermented. And then the actual distillation takes place first in the wash still. So you will get from after the first distillation, roughly a 25% ABV um, new make spirit. And then you distill it again. Second distillation takes, takes place in the pot stills. And after that, it is put into oak casks to mature. Now, I will briefly touch here some common mistakes that beginners do but really how to approach whiskey i will cover this in great detail in session four so please be patient right now i just felt the urge to already put in here to the introduction what are the what are things that actually you should pay attention to and ideally omit so people tend to decide solely based on the price or a packaging when they buy a whiskey so I know that many people don't have a clue or don't have the nerves or the time to check what kind of whiskey to buy, but it is very dangerous to just pick randomly a bottle of whiskey because there are so many types. Also, being impatient and rushing whiskey is always a bad thing. So if you don't have the time or the energy, just forget whiskey. You really have to be patient because whiskey drinking is really a journey a marathon and not a sprint drink not for the pleasure but just to drink really if you get if you want to get drunk don't drink expensive whiskey it doesn't make any sense also people put ice and coke in the glass so in the whiskey that's really a no-go so in good whiskey you never put any ice or any coke so some tips but again we'll cover this later on 
in greater detail. So first, let the whiskey sit in the glass. So whiskey is a very concentrated, strong alcohol. So it's, it's pretty much closed when you pour it. So be patient, pour it in the glass and let it breathe. And it will open up and you will enjoy it much more. Always drink it on room temperature. This is really important. Otherwise, if you cool it down, if you put ice in it, then the aromas and flavors will be muted. Add a couple of drops of water. That will, again, help to open up your whiskey. So air, letting it rest, and a couple of drops of water will make it more accessible. Read about it and try to explore the flavors. You will see very soon that whiskey drinking is all about exploring and enjoying the flavors. So if you have no clue how to explore that, watch session number four. If, or if you are impatient, then you will find for, for good whiskeys, you will always find a short description on the distillery website or already on the bottle or on the box, on the packaging. And they will give you some guidance, what kind of aromas and what kind of flavors you should uh, you should be looking for. Now, whiskey recommendation. If you Google this or if you ask the experts, the, here is a list, so to say, a consensus list that will everybody will uh, suggest you. Why? These whiskies are very smooth, very subtle, very light, and usually very fruity. So, you know, if you had a bad experience with whiskey and you try one of these, you will have success, this success feeling right away. Why? Because it won't burn. You will pick up some flavors. It will be smooth. You will enjoy it a lot. But you don't have to start there. In fact, I have brought here some personal recommendations. So, for example, Irish whiskey is always a good starting point because they are by design more subtle more approachable so jameson black barrel is really a really really worthy whiskey good price quality ratio i can highly recommend it but also red breast or teeling are the big irish brands that you should be looking for scottish single malts as i said probably the most complex liquid on earth you could start with the bunahaven 12 years old or tabermori these are bottled with a bit higher strength, but they are very delicious, very correct, very rich. Have they have a lot of correct character, and uh, I can highly recommend both of them. The Bunahaven is more like sherry, and dark fruits, and some honey. The Tobermory has more like light fruits, like apple, pears, and so on. Smoky whiskey. People will tell you don't start with smoky whiskey, but I strongly encourage you to do so. Actually, I fall in love with smoky whiskey right away. You will never know what you like until you try it. So here are two categories. First, light smoky single malts. Talisker Sky or Highland Park 12 years old are widely available and also they are not that expensive. So I can truly recommend that for everyone. And if you are, if you want to try something else, you are, uh, you want to try uh, a bit yeah, heftier uh, whiskies than Bowmore or Kulila are very good names out there and are also very affordable. And there, I also put a link where you can find some more suggestions. People tend to like these top 10 lists and in my opinion, they are pretty good here on Whiskey Suggest. So if you need a second opinion or if you want to browse some whiskies, go to this page. And now let's talk about price and value. How much does a good whiskey cost? It's not a trivial question. And the more expensive, the better. The answer is not necessarily. Why? You have to understand that price and quality is not necessarily linear. The relationship is not necessarily li linear. Let me give you my subjective categorization for whiskey prices. So below 25, it's almost impossible to buy a good whiskey. Of course, you can buy something, but don't expect too much from that. If you are willing to pay a bit more, already for between 25 and 40, you will get very much, much more for your money. So better, much better whiskeys for, uh, for an, ad an additional top-up. 
The sweet spot is then really between 40 and 60, where I think the price quality or price value ratio is just the best. The, 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 most, uh, re, uh, the, the most famous or so to say the, the, the very uh, famous distilleries uh, all have their roughly have their core ranges, their offerings between these price ranges. So you are, if you are willing to pay this much, I can guarantee you, you will get a lot and you will enjoy it a lot. It's not cheap, but it's really worth the money. For fine pellets, and this is roughly where I am right now in my journey, it's between 60 and 120. Buy these whiskeys if you can already really appreciate and pick up the flavors and really have an opinion about the whiskey. This is already a lot of money, so if you are not, if you're at the beginning, probably doesn't make that much sense to start with those whiskeys. And then above 120, and I'm not even talking about the four digit area, it gets very tricky. Because what drives prices? So, first of all, economics 101 supply and demand. If the whiskey, if the whiskeys are rare, the price will automatically increase. But does this mean that the whiskey is better? No. So you have to understand that if a whiskey is older or if a whiskey is not that available, even if it's not remarkably good, the price will automatically rise. So don't be fooled by high, high prices. Also, something like collectability is very dangerous because there are whiskies that can be collected and people will be happy to pay more because they just need it for their collection. But again, does this mean that the, the value or the quality is that good? No. And there are trends and marketing all the time. So, you know, sometimes some whiskies or some, some regions are super hot and people for some reason want to rush there and buy that stuff which will ultimately, again, pump prices. So keep this in mind and really understand that I could show you a, 50, a, a bottle that costs 50 euros and I could show you a bottle that is 200 euros because I already tasted several one of them from this area. And if I don't tell you which one is which, I'm not sure whether you could tell you, okay? So it won't be four times better. Could, it could be even the case that the 50, euro, 50 euros bottle will, will offer you more. Don't be full, really. This takes time and experience, but now you heard it and now you know that you have to look out for this. Question, is older better? Is more expensive better? Not necessarily. Please believe me and you will see for yourself soon too, hopefully. Congratulations, you made it to the end. I know that I talked about a lot of things, but I hope you enjoyed this journey. And here, just briefly, let me summarize the key takeaways. So tasting and exploring whiskey is really like a friendship. It has ups and downs. It takes a lot of time and effort, but it's a great journey and it's a lovely thing. So if you want to do this, really be patient and just enjoy it. You cannot crush this in a, day, in a day or in a week or after watching three videos. Try it, try it, start it somewhere and it will be fine. You cannot rush it, be patient. Yes, or drink vodka. Quality over quantity all the time. This is the first and most important principle of drinking and tasting whiskey. Experiment and see what you like. Don't take any advice for, for granted. It's like I gave you here my hints, my tips but also feel free to check other websites and try it and try it and decide it for yourself. Taste is subjective. What I like, you might not like it and vice versa. Whiskey is science and art at the same time, as we saw that Scotch whiskey is a result of several coincidences. So you know that why they use barley and not corn, for example, why do they use used casks and not new casks? And stuff like this. Why do they have to mature whiskey in the first place? So you see that you have to know a bit of the history to truly enjoy and understand scotch or whiskey in general. So if you need guidance, reviews, or an opinion, subscribe to my channel, obviously. But if you need a second opinion, here I listed several web pages, apps, 
YouTube channels that you can also follow for second opinion. That being said, I say thank you very much for your attention. I will soon come back with session four, where I show you how you should approach and taste whiskey. But until then, take care and I will see you then. Bye bye.